Hello and welcome to the Untranslatable Podcast. We are here recording episode 167, and today we will be talking about the easiest languages to learn. If you tuned into uh, episode 165, we were discussing some of the most difficult languages to learn. Today we will be talking about the easiest languages to learn, so if you're feeling a little overwhelmed or discouraged from episode 165, this is the episode for you. Or if you are just looking for um, an easier language to pick up, maybe it's your first time taking the plunge into learning a foreign language, then this episode is just for you. So I'm curious to see what uh, knowledge, nuggets, and gems my uh, partner in crime has dug up. So without further ado, my buddy Jared, what's going on, Jared? Bonjour. Hello. Bonjour. From Derived from the language French. Which theoretically might be considered an Engli- in- easy language for us English speakers to learn, but that was not the case for me. Uh, however, please spread a little love. I mean, however, regardless of what I just said, follow us on Instagram, Untranslatable Podcast. Follow us on Twitter, Untranslatable One, the number one. Follow us on um, nothing else, but you can go to our uh, website, untranslatablepodcast.com. And you can also give us five star reviews. Pleasure. Please actually give us five star reviews on iTunes and Stitcher. Hey, I know you're hearing this. Give us five star reviews. Chad, are you okay? Please tell me you're okay. I'm doing good. What Jared is asking about people is the uh, coronavirus, mm-hmm. which is not related to Corona beer in Mexico. So if you are a Corona drinker, you can keep drinking that and enjoying yeah, don't it. Don't worry. Don't worry. But Live it mas. is the that's, That's Taco right. Bell. That, 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 that is Taco Bell, <laughs> not Corona. But yeah, the coronavirus is a... Uh, so, well, so there's two types of coronavirus from my understanding. There, the standard coronavirus is basically kind of like a virus like your common cold. Mm-hmm. However, this coronavirus, which they're calling the novel coronavirus, uh, is uh, a very, very uh, dangerous virus that can caused pneumonia uh, and has actually already claimed some lives of some people that's true uh, here in china mm-hmm. it, uh, how how are how's the can you sense the 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 feet like i don't want to say the fear but can you sense that there's that that there's a deadly virus on the loose as you walk around or engage with people or i, I don't know have you been engaging with people are you staying quar- are you quarantining I- yourself I've I've more or less been quarantined, um, not because but that's I'm just because you live anything. a sedimentary lifestyle. That's <laughs> no, no. That's because I'm on vacation and I'm relaxed, that's true. And enjoying my vacation. That's true. Uh, yeah, yeah. My my girlfriend and I haven't really left her apartment in the last five or six days, mm. so we're out there. Um, Would one, you have because let- everything can be delivered here, so we don't need that's to true. go grocery shopping. It can be delivered. Uh, food can be ordered. Um, and then we've been playing video games and uh, watching what movies kind of video and games chilling. You play? Uh, Divinity. It's like a RPG a role player game. It's a lot of fun. Um, you can do like a two player. Yeah, yeah. That's one of the few RPG games you can actually do two player, which is pretty interesting. Cool. Uh, and my girlfriend's super good at it, so she she carries the team. That's for sure, Jared. Um, but yeah. But anyways, <laughs> back to the back to the coronavirus. So it. it it started in Wuhan, China, which is in the southern central part of China. Um, uh, I think the first couple cases were actually in late December. Um, and now Wuhan is on complete lockdown. Um, yeah, I'm not no sure in, how no that out. works. Yep, complete lockdown. Um, and uh, there are tons and tons of cases there. Um, I think that's where the most people have died. Uh, they say it started from a wet market, which is like a live <sighs> seafood and animal market. Yeah, the term wet market oh, just sounds kind of gross. Market. Yeah, of course diseases they, so, are coming from the wet market. <laughs> right. The The thing is, is that... Come get um, your wet fish and wet cheese. Well, well, you're probably not getting wet cheese, but... Uh, oh, right. You didn't first, say cheese. They, they first, they <laughs> I first cheese, started... So. Um, They first started to think that it was caused by a type of cat that's eaten. Uh, It's a delicacy, Mm. I guess, in Wuhan. It's 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 like some strange, like wild cat. Um, Mm. I think it's called like a 
tabby. Cyril cat or something. Then oh. they thought it was from bats. Uh, apparently, there's a, mm. a food down there also that they eat called bat soup. Listen. Google that, Jared, Ugh. if you want nightmares. Bat soup. Um, oh, I don't like looking at live bats, but I'll look it up. I'll look it up. Bat so look it up. soup. You'll, you'll, you'll be ready for a tasty meal after we're finished oh, recording this. Oh, no. Okay, okay, it's okay. okay, 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 whole, okay, okay it's yeah. basically a whole bat in a soup. It's a whole bat with its stomach, like the stomach where the I assume all the guts are just... Oh. Yep. All right, listen. Bat I'm going to go cry for a six hours, then we can now, continue this podcast. Oh, my God. Now, Why Jared, am I still looking think, at this? Yeah, I would close that tab. But now <laughs> they they say uh, now they say that they think it comes Ugh. from snakes. So I'm not really sure what it came from. This but is, it came from keep, a live animal. It's getting worse. Right, <laughs> right. Um, so yeah, and in Beijing there have been I think 26 or 27 confirmed cases. Those uh, seem like big numbers. Now I know Beijing has millions of people. Mm-hmm. But I, I like. I wonder. If, I mean, there's someone also doing this, doing the math, science, geography. Like, how close are these people? Do these people interact with each other in any sort of like, you know, like this person works with this person who hands something well, see, to this person he, well, kind of see, thing? Here's, here's the thing. So the cases that have happened outside of Wuhan have all been, from my understanding, have all been related to Wuhan. Like, there have been some people who, uh, I think there were been like two or four cases in Thailand, a couple cases in South Korea, mm-hmm. um, U.S. as well. I think there's one or two oh, cases in Washington. Um, and Chicago. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Mm-hmm. And, I, and at least the, the ones that I knew about were all, they all had traveled to Wuhan. Same with the ones in Beijing. Um, the scary thing for me right now, because I'm in Beijing, is that... Um, the highest amount of travel from Wuhan usually goes Wuhan to Beijing, especially if it's international travel, because they go mm. Wuhan, Beijing, and then somewhere else. Um, right. Um, so you're in a hub. So, I mean, you're definitely in a yeah, hub. Yeah. Now the the other interesting thing, though, Jared, is that in Wuhan they are building a hospital right now that resembles the SARS era in China, where they're building, I think there's going to be like 10,000 hospital beds, and they're going to do it more or less exactly the same way as they did it for SARS. And it's pretty crazy, Jared. This hospital will be constructed, they say, by February 3rd. So that's how quick Damn. they're getting everything going. <laughs> um, but I mean, that's, this is uh, pretty... For those of you that don't know, that's essentially a week away uh, at this yeah. from when we're recording this. Yeah. And so it's... But, you know, I appreciate the fact that they're taking this seriously, um, there have been, I think, five or six other cities near Wuhan that are also now on lockdown. So, um, yeah, they're really trying to contain the virus. Yeah, um, it did catch my attention that it is now in the United States. And, I mean, this just literally, this is pretty brand new. But, like, um, I'd be interested to see the sort of reaction it, it, it has on people. Um you know, it, it now it's starting to get very reminiscent of those days of SARS, which was too. I mean, I mean, to me at least, I was a child in two thousand three. Uh, um, not that I know much more about this virus, but like it seemed just like this sort of you know, m- you know, mystery murderous virus that just came from a foreign country. And it's like, oh no, it's and it's so like I don't know, it's so like sci fi movie ish almost. But well, um, if you've seen the movie Contagion, um, it's kind of like that. Although, although this virus thankfully isn't as deadly as the virus. And have you seen Contagion, Jared? No. no when you I get haven't. the when you get the virus in the movie Contagion, you more or less like die within like a day or two. Um, mm. So thankfully, with this, from my understanding of it, what I've read online, the incubation period is anywhere from they think like ten to fourteen days. Um. And I'm not sure how long you are um, able to give the virus to other people. Uh, in the early stages, they thought it was only uh, spreadable through um, like animal to human. Obviously, now that is not the case because it has evolved mm-hmm. and is going human to human. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't have that many cases. Um, mm-hmm. So, and they shut down the market where they said they traced it from. Um, is it cur- it is curable though, right? Or, or not curable, Beijing, treatable. In in Beijing, there has actually been one case of a recovered person so far. Like I said, I think there were twenty six people. 
Um, one has recovered. Um, 25 yeah. have died? Well, it, no, no, no. It doesn't. No, oh, they still have still it. in the hospital. Here, let me. Okay. I can look. I can look real quick. So I have this thing on my WeChat right now that actually has um, updates. Um, the death because, toll from the virus has increased to forty-one. By the way, I just—it's right in front of me. Oh wow! Okay. Um, the announcement comes as the U.S. Senate Department has warned Americans not to enter Chinese Hubei province due to coronavirus, as Chinese authorities announced the death toll from the virus has increased to forty-one. The U.S. is also pulling out most of its diplomats and their families from the consulate general in Huan, the city of 11 million in which cases of the new virus were discovered. The State Department issued a new travel advisory late Thursday declaring the Hubei region level four do not travel the strongest of the four travel warning levels issued by the u.s government why do they go what one to four how do they choose yeah. these, these numbers let's stick with a I'm not sure I, I think we've all agreed that we're either going to do one to fives one to tens those are those one to three even those are numbers that we work with one to four no one uses that that puts right. it on par with hot spots in war zones like north korea syria and iran so there, Which there you is go. pretty intense, serious I would stuff. imagine. Yeah, serious stuff. Yeah. Um, but so far, so good. Uh, we're planning on just For chilling. And, yeah, so far, so good. Let's just be clear. Uh, <laughs> and knock on some wood. Um, yes. But yeah, there have been cases of recovery, though. Um, however, what's a little scary, though, is in the beginning, uh, the only people who had passed away were elderly people with compromised immune systems. However, mm. I read yesterday that a 36-year-old man who was completely healthy before the virus ended up passing mm. away. So mm. I don't know what's happening. Uh, there's obviously no vaccine for it because it's a virus. Um, we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, keep your fingers yeah. crossed, people. Uh, if you are religious, uh, send prayers to all of the people who are affected. Um, and I hope that... Uh, that it will be taken care of soon. Um, Because I think SARS was almost a year um, where they had this problem. Um, Okay. I don't... Like, I was so... I don't barely... Like, I just remember it by name. Just because I'm so... Like, I was so young at the time. Right. Dude, I mean, I I guess you don't have much interaction from people, but like... Yeah, I don't know. Trying to avoid it right now. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Do Do you wear your mask inside sometimes? No. No, no, not inside. No. Yeah, I, I took the trash either. out yesterday, and I did wear my mask when I did that. Mm. Okay. okay. Didn't see Do anybody wanna... though. No people. No people at all. So it was like a ghost down here. Yeah, but yeah let's eerie. spread some love. Let's spread spread a some love. love it's weird my not to see today. people in Beijing <laughs> as you walk it outside. <laughs> it is. Although a lot of people who who move to Beijing for work tend to leave the city during Chinese New Year to spend time with their families. Oh right, 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 right. So, right. so yeah. Uh, anyways, time to spread some love. And my shout out goes out to um, all love. the people and all the libraries right now who have been embracing the digital reading landscape through mm. uh, ebooks, audiobooks, special pr- programming, and other technologies. In 2019, there was a record breaking year for digital checkouts with over 326 million ebooks and audiobooks checked out from libraries and schools. Um, mm. Last year, there were 73 public library systems that notably contributed to that number by lending over 1 million digital titles each, adding eight new libraries to the elite Overdrive Million Checkout Club. Uh, And so the top ones, because I know Jared's curious which ones were the top ones. Number one, Jared, uh, a recent On the Road Again destination for you, the Toronto Public Library System came at the top of the list. Shout out. Right, right. Uh, <laughs> clocking in at over 6.5 million checkouts in 2019. And then there were five other places that loaned more than 5 million digital titles each, which was the Los Angeles Public Library, Wisconsin Public Library, uh, King County Library System in Washington, the Ohio, oh, excuse me, the Ohio Digital Library, and New York Public Library as well. So I think that's really awesome. Uh, Shout out Mm -hmm. to not only all these libraries, but all these people embracing these uh, digital digital forms of media um, for reading and for learning. I think that's super awesome. Me too. Me too. Are you a fan of e-books, Jared? I don't read a lot. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't read a lot. I don't don't e-read a lot. 
my 95% of my listening is involves podcasts. Mm. I do feel I like I learn a lot though. Like like it's oh, not I all agree. I listen to some comedy stuff that's just ha ha hoo hoo he ooh jokes here jokes there. <laughs> but I feel like right. I do listen to stuff that um are of my interest, you know, car related or things where I can mm. just learn things in general. Right. Have you that's seen that it's been podcasts. trending on a uh, it's been trending on on the social medias about um about uh Joe Rogan being a uh, like a racist and that and that you know he just um he just um what like, happened? It, it, I haven't heard about. He this. just endorsed Bernie Sanders, saying that he'd vote for him. And now, like people are saying, "Oh no, you need to, uh, you need to renounce that endorsement because he's a, you know, he's a right wing apologist." Anyway, that was a uh, neither here nor there. <laughs> this is the untranslatable owl representing um, untranslatables, idioms, sayings, proverbs that don't really make any sense, mm-hmm. uh, but they do have a meaning. If you just give him a moment and listen to uh, listen. So what we usually do is I go on the internet and I find a whole bunch of fun untranslatables. And I did that. And uh, both you and I, I think this it was partially my fault too, not just yours, had an internet sort of breakdown a couple days ago. And you heard some of my untranslatables. And I don't want to use them. So I went to our friend at untranslatable.co on Instagram for some inspiration. I don't like to do this because it feels like a cop-out because it's like, listen, I can get untranslatables too. You're not the only one that can find untranslatables. Right. But it's a great but, resource. Uh, untranslatable. The, game <laughs> the game doesn't work. The game doesn't work if you've already heard them. True. Anyway, my first one is uh, going to be Dutch, and it's Ik ga stuk. And it translates to I'm breaking. Is that like, uh, I can't even? Uh, no, but close. You, you, yes, you can even, but because of something, you know? You're, you see someone... Like, it's hmm. winter here in, in, uh, in Michigan. You're freezing? And you see someone walk, try to cross the street, but they, uh, they slip on ice. And it's, yeah, I can't even. It's like, I oh. shouldn't. But what I'm going to do is... Crack I'm up. I'm going to... Yeah, there you go. There you go. Okay. I like that. Crack up. That's, yeah. It means I'm dying of laughter or cracking up, as we would say. There we go. Well, at least one of the two of us um, are not lazy. Uh, maybe it's because I'm in vacation but the good mode news right is, now. Mm-hmm. The good news is I don't listen to you really anyway, so these are still <laughs> brand new to me. I was, I was going to say I'm also testing Jared's memory a little bit. So, <laughs> um, so the first one that I'm going to give you, Jared, is... Uh, klar wie Klosbrühe. Oh. Klar wie Klosbrühe. Clear as... When I hear Brühe, I, I, I think beer, but I know it's, it can't be beer related. No. Dumpling broth. Dumpling broth. Now, I do remember this one. And I... My thought was, like, clear as mud to be an English... Uh, to be an English translation or like an English untranslatable similar. Because mm-hmm. I don't know what dumpling broth looks like. It's it's a little cloudy, but I think it's, for the most part, you can still see through it. Mm. Still see through it. Well, then I'm going to say it's like, it's clear as day. Like, it's right in front of you. The answer is right in front of you. Yeah, more or less. Or crystal clear. Crystal clear. Yeah, but see? I mean, I'm going to give that to me, but... That's not what you, <laughs> it's not crystal clear. What no broth is crystal clear. Like I yeah, don't even I, no broth is crystal clear. So if you if you make That's if water. You make, if you make German style or Austrian style dumplings, Ugh. the water is pretty clear, Jared. Pretty hmm. clear. Didn't you make dumplings in Austria? With uh why would I, uh, why our would German I be teacher? Dumpling? We made dumplings. Oh, yeah. I guess so. I don't, yeah, but it was in a pot. Like you can't see through the. I don't know. I wasn't paying attention to the. I think you're looking too, water. too into this. Too into this. But anyways, give me All give right. me another untranslatable. I'll give you one more. Shout out to untranslatable.co. They have one here that's uh, salty from the United States. But you know what that means. That mm. means to be upset. Yep. Um. All right. I got an Australian one. That's an, that's a language that you would think as Americans would be easy for us to learn, but I wonder mm, if it nope. would be. Nope. I mean, it is English, 
But uh, eh, what, more or less. What is? Have you said this one before? Whoop whoop. Uh uh-uh. uh. Whoop whoop. Whoop whoop. Can you give me some? I need some. I need something. Um. You know, uh, the first time I, you know, I, I, I remember the first time driving to your house and being like, man, is this where Chad lives? I feel like I'm uh, in the whoop whoop. Oh, out in the country. I think I did use that one before. Out in the country. In the middle of nowhere, yes. Is it whoop yeah. whoop or wop wop? I mean, it's W-O-O-P-W-O-O-P. Okay, so I don't know how they pronounce okay. it. Hey, by the way, we do have listeners in uh, Australia. Let us know. But first, give us five star reviews because I'm desperate. Chad doesn't care, but I do. Um, right. I shouldn't care. You know, I don't need you guys. Um, yeah, we do, Jared. Reviews. Don't say that. Fast don't say reviews. that. All right. Um, that's Next true. one for you is also German. I was lazy and wanted to do some quote unquote easy languages. So I did German and Spanish. Uh, this is a good one. I know you like this one, Jared. Mit ihm kann man Pferde stehlen. Uh, oh, yeah. With him can one horses steal with him you can yes. steal horses mm-hmm. um, or i love and, this translation here jared this isn't word for word but i think meaning wise is pretty good gone horse stealing i like that it has a nice ring to it gone horse stealing me and timmy done gone horse stealing that sounds very yeah exactly it's like it's like eat like a, my ride or die you know you could do anything with this person it's exactly. like you, you, you like like if if in any sort of crazy scenario, I know this person's on board with it. Hey, let's go steal a horse. All right, exactly. Bro. We, I used to have a friend like that in college. You know, it's interesting you say down for whatever. I used to have a friend like that in college, and we and I would call him DFA because he was always he would always say down, I'm for, down anything. for anything. Who? Yeah. Can Can you just say the first name? I'm curious. Uh, Zach. Well, I can say the whole name. Zach oh. Francis. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> For sure, for sure. <clears throat> no one, anyways, yeah, no one listens. To anyways, those. I feel like you for, you forget that. <laughs> People do listen to it. I think you forget that. Uh, Zach uh, Francis, anyways, you're down for anything. Give us, uh, give us another one. I mean, he's still around. I, I don't say to like, uh, no, please, give, please give us another one. Uh, all right, uh, let's see here. Uh, this one is also similar to English. Schlafen wie ein Murmeltier. Sleep like a woodchuck. Oh, it's like to sleep like a. Like, you know, like a log. It's like you're out like exactly. a log. Out exactly. like a light. All right, I'll give you one more. Fine, 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 fine. Uh, my, this is uh, Malay, and it's Yum Cha, which means to drink tea. That's, I'm drinking tea not, right now, actually. That's not like Kermit sipping tea, is it? <laughs> no, no, no. No, okay, to drink tea. Is it to... Hmm. It's more like uh, England sipping tea. Is it like to sit back and relax? Yeah, no. 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 Okay, what is it? No. It's to hang out. So it is to sit back and relax. Oh, That's why out. I hesitated. Okay. But it's to sit back uh, and relax to chill with other people. Right. Hang out. Okay, nice. I got one more uh, last one for you, Jared. This one will be a new one because this happened, I think, before. Uh, hey, mine was a new one, too, by the way. Technical, that, uh, one, that one was, that one was, was a Jared find. I didn't give any credit to... Uh... That one go was ahead, a good please. Jared fine, that's for sure. <laughs> so, here we you. go, Jared. Uh, pedir peras al olmo, which means to ask the elm tree for pears. It's like you're barking up the wrong tree. Uh, Would be the quite. English. Nope. Nope. Hmm. It's like you're confused, like you don't understand you, the situation. Can you, get, can you get pears from an elm tree, Jared? Is that possible? No. No. So, yeah, I feel like so you're barking up the wrong tree. Like you're 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 go looking going to the wrong place for you're looking going to the wrong place for answers. You're not gonna get it. Not quite. This is an expression used for those who ask for the impossible. I feel like barking up the wrong tree oh, is more like okay. you just come to the wrong place. Yeah, Whereas yeah, this it's not impossible. So. I'm just not the yeah. one to do it for you. That's true. Right. That's true. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. All right. Well, Jared, let's let's talk about what makes a language easy to learn and then share some mm-hmm. easy languages for people to learn. How many cases do we have? In English? Yes. Oh, God. We. You're you and I. lose my job as an English teacher, Jared. Uh, I mean, really, I think, in, generally speaking, I think there's really only two cases in English, I guess. Um, 
because we do have, it's not used very often, but we do use things like with whom or to whom. Mm, oh, um, that's true. But yeah. generally speaking, I mean, English is not really a case Only if language. you're a douche, though, you know. Or, or you're kidding. writing something kidding. formally. I will say, Jared, when I teach my classes, I will use with whom, and I will also try to speak, like, if I say, I don't try to put the preposition at the end of a sentence. So, for example... You know, yeah. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, for, no, no. For example, I, I try to say like something like, uh, and it sounds weird saying it, but grammatically speaking, it is correct. Um, something like, you know, um, this is the book which has the grammar. Uh, uh, I would say like, this is the book in which, uh, no, I, I'm not sure how I would say it now, but I try to put prepos. I don't try to say the prepositions at the end of the sentence. Well, you're not we supposed to, to technically. Do. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Technically you're not supposed to do that. Right. Apparently. Well, German, mm-hmm. as obviously we'll talk about is considered an, in- an easy language for uh, Americans to learn for because English speakers. Yes. Yeah, excuse me. I'm sorry. For it's for English speakers to learn because that grammar structure is similar. Like mm-hmm. like they they do say that like our, our structure follows sort of that accusative, nominative, dative slash genitive form, but accusative and nominative are just the same in English. And yeah. then and then the dative or genitive might be that with whom or or something yeah. like that. Exactly. The only thing is, I would say the vast majority of Americans, including me either don't know how to use it or choose not right. to so they don't sound pretentious. I'm I'm a true. mix of Very I'm true. a mix of not knowing how to use it and sometimes knowing to use it but not using it just cuz I don't want to be that guy. Right. Right. Well, you know, there's a lot of factors that make a language quote unquote easy or difficult to learn. Um mm-hmm. but I think the number one I've been thinking about this for quite a while, Jared, and I think the number one thing that makes it well what what do you think my number one aspect of making a a Hmm. language easy to learn would be well i can think of what my number one might think my my number one might be but if i were to get in that to the head of chad i would say it would be the willingness or like the dedication or motivation to learn Ding, ding, ding. Very good, buddy. Mm -hmm. Very, very good. Yeah, I think motivation is the is the key because because and I agree from, that that's a top mm-hmm. one for sure. Yeah, because I think it's number one. Because um, I think you could even learn a quote unquote difficult language to learn, like Arabic, uh, if Arabic or um, Mandarin or Japanese. I'm trying to or Russian. I'm trying to think back from episode 165, some of the difficult ones, or Finnish or Hungarian. Um, but mm-hmm. I think if you're highly motivated to learn those languages uh, and you make it fun. It won't, I mean, yes, there are going to be difficulties, but it won't be as difficult for you as someone who's not motivated. Like if you're forced sure. to learn a language in school, for example, um, and you're not motivated, you're not going to learn it. It's just not going to I mean, as I've, as I've said to you before, it's like me uh, taking French for my entire like elementary, middle school as I lived in the United States and learning essentially close to nothing. And then within mm. like six months of living in Germany, being way more proficient in German than I ever was in the years and years of learning French, just because it's like, well, I live there. Like, I have the motivation where it's like, right. I kind of have to learn this. I live here. <laughs> right. Well, and you have more opportunities to use it, too. Yeah, sure. I think yeah. in, in a way well, makes it a bit more motivating, too. That is um, another one of the uh, things that I would say that goes along with, you know, making it the easiest language to learn is having access to it. Oh, absolutely. So, like, I would say English might not theoretically be the Engl- easiest language for a lot of people to learn. I mm-hmm. think it's, I mean, I think it's almost undis- it's undeniably the easiest language to access for, yeah. for the, for, for, you know, most of the uh, world. I would agree and with so, that because in, of in, film, in the Eng- music, movies, absolutely. Right, and and yeah, the widest variety of media and stuff in English, and not even American stuff. Obviously, there are other places that speak English too. But right. um, so I think exposure to it helps, and that's why I think even though English might not theoretically be the easiest to a lot of people, it is the easiest to get access to. But I think obviously also a number another huge one will be relation to your language. So mm-hmm. there, so there's the sort of the assumption that um, you know if you're a Spanish speaker, uh, French or Portuguese or Italian would be 
easier languages for you to learn than say i don't know japanese for for example right right yeah what jared means is how closely related the language is to your own native language uh which yeah. i would agree i would definitely agree um they say that for english speakers uh, and i don't agree with with this to some extent uh norwegian and dutch are a bit easier um we'll, well we always talk about those too Mm -hmm. We always talk about how great, I mean, Dutch speakers are, and it is because their language is very similar, like, to, to English and German. And going back on what you said with access to language, I don't know if you know this, Jared, but at least one of my colleagues in the Czech Republic, uh, whose sister lives in the Netherlands, uh, apparently they have all their movies in English. They don't dub them in Dutch. They might uh, have Dutch subtitles, have subtitles, but I think yeah. a lot of times they don't even have subtitles. Um, yeah, which just goes to show you, if you That'll can watch a movie in the native language, um, mm -hmm. or sorry, in your non-native language, um, especially without subtitles, that's that's difficult. Uh, that's not easy. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I struggle with that. At, probably still after four years of living in in Germany, like in my height right. of speaking it, I, that was probably still a challenge for me to just right. watch a full movie and be like, I right. I got everything they said. I'm fully right. on board with well, everything that's happening. And the there. tricky thing with movies is that there's a lot more going on that you have to focus on. Yeah, right? you have to focus on the the the, the scenery, what's going on in the background, the time period. The, it might not be taking place right. in current day. It was like, all right, is True. that that's might be slang that you might catch on to if you know the language well enough. Right. But otherwise, that's just a random word to me. Plus, there's background music. Sometimes characters are whispering, so it's hard to hear. Um, mm. Oh, the like, whispering. Yeah. I hate the whispering. Or babies. Right. Babies is another one. I oh, can never yeah. understand babies. Yep. That's true. That's very true. <laughs> yeah. I had, I had that problem when I was in Germany. Like, little kids would talk to me, and, and because they use different words. Like, Jared, do you know what Heiermachen is? No. It sounds gross. It sounds uh, like throwing up or something. It means to, poop? to go, go to sleep. Go to bed. Oh, okay. Hi, Ready by time. Yeah. Yeah. The kids okay. use all sorts of different words. Um, so, yeah. Uh, but definitely the relation to your native language is helpful. Um, and, and there are different families of languages. Like there's a Germanic uh, kind of tree. There's, there's like a, um, I'm not sure what the correct linguistic term is. This has been like three or four years now. I don't remember. But there are all these different like branches. Maybe you can Google it for me, Jared. Like branches of. Oh, of, Yeah. Language, language families trees. yeah and uh and you can see and so if you're curious you can you can google this or for our listeners in china you can mm -hmm. bing it and find language family uh and you can find languages that are ask related Jeeves. to yours uh <laughs> is that even around anymore ask jeeves i'll tell you ask hold on as jeeves.com but yeah and the nice thing is about fails. a lot of oh it's still here Oh, nice. Interesting. The The interesting thing, too, about languages that are close to your native language is not obviously good. there will be a lot of similarities <laughs> in terms of cognates. The one thing that might be different, though, to languages that are similar to your native language but have some differences is uh, mm. pronunciation. You know, like yes. I, I know a lot of Spanish speakers who can read um, Italian or Portuguese, but that does not mean that they can speak it. Um, mm. And there might also be some false cognates, some words that you think you know sure. what they mean, but they don't yeah, mean the false same friends. thing. Mm -hmm. um, can I, just a, a quick sort of quick little quiz here. Mm -hmm. um, if you were to speak Tagalog, uh, uh -huh. language spoken in the Philippines, uh -huh. what would you think would be a, uh, a, good, a good base or, or, or a, like what, what native speakers would, would, could easily catch on to or maybe easier than others catch on to Tagalog? So I'm going to go out on a limb here. And okay. I'm, I'm going go to do on this one because I think you're asking me this. So I think, I think this one's uh, an answer you wouldn't expect. So I'm going to give you an answer that you wouldn't expect, which is Spanish. Because mm -hmm. I do know there, there is go. some Spanish Brilliant. in Tagalog and... Um, I think they were become... colonized by the Spanish exactly. too. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I and had there a, is a lot from of the Spanish. Oh, go ahead. I had a friend from the Philippines, and her uh, Facebook page had what I thought was a lot of Spanish, but then later I learned mm. was uh, Tagalog. Yeah, there there is a lot of Spanish influence there, from what I've heard, and there, and, and a lot of like Spanish sounding names and uh, mm. uh, there as well. Now this one might be easy, but Haitian Creole, which is obviously spoken in Haiti. Uh, that be or in France, or excuse French? me, Louisiana too. 
Yeah, that'd be I, I French. I meant to say yeah. Louisiana. Yes, it is French. Uh huh. Um, let's see. Let's think of another. One. All right, that's all I'm going to give you for. Well, oh, Swiss right. German, Jared. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, I'll give you actually one more. Afrikaans. Afri- Afrikaans. Afri- Afrikaans. This one's this one's an interesting one because it's a mishmash and a hodgepodge of English, Dutch, and German. Is there German in there, or yeah. is it just Dutch? According to according to because the saying, native speakers of Afrikaans English, I've talked to, have also said German. Saying English, Dutch, and a mix, uh, uh like a hodgepodge of English, Dutch, and German, seems kind of like a, is the word not oxymoron, but it doesn't seem right because it's like all these languages, like like you're naming three very similar languages, where right. it's like. Almost, how can you even almost sort of differentiate between, oh, is this, like, uh, on some words, was this, a du- did they get this from the Dutch or the Germans on some words, you know? Because then they make it their own also after that. True, true. I'm not really sure. It'd be fun to do an episode and explore some more Afrikaans. I could even ask, um, I have a couple friends from South Africa here in China. I could ask them. Um, and see if they would be interested in coming on and uh, talking about it. Because <clears throat> the history of the language is pretty fascinating, and I think it's it's a fairly young language, if I'm not mistaken. Um, mm. I could be wrong, um, but I think in comparison to other languages, it's fairly I young. I mean, South Africa is a fairly new country. Right. Did you know, by the way, um, that um, Indonesian, where do you think, let me ask you, not did you know, where do you think... Who do you think would would have a surprisingly or a, a easy time learning Indonesian? Indonesian? Obviously, there are more than one, but I'm thinking of one. Uh, I have no idea. <clears throat> Can you give me a clue? This selection may come as a surprise, but Indonesian has several qualities that makes it a logical choice for English speakers. Really? For, for okay. starters, this is coming from Babel. For okay. starters, Indonesian speakers... Uh, excuse me. Indonesian native... Uh, Indonesia, I really should just start wearing my glasses. Indonesian, spoken natively by nearly 23 million people, is one of a few Asian languages that use the Latin alphabet we know and love, first of all. Oh, so that already gives okay. you a little uh, step help. up there. Many Asian languages are incredibly difficult for English speakers to master due to the unfamiliar characters in their writing systems, but not Indonesian. It's also a phonetic language made up of words that are pronounced exactly the way they're spelled. That That's is helpful. something that I, and I assume probably you too, love mm-hmm. about German. Oh, yeah. It's a game changer. Game changer and I've mentioned sure. that to you before. I, I've mentioned this to you before. I don't even know if I mentioned this on the podcast, but I've definitely mentioned this to you before. It's impossible to have a spelling bee in German. Right, same because with Spanish it's, as well. It's just, it's it's obvious. It's, it's it's exactly how it sounds. Is how it's spelled. There's it's there's, you can't, like that. It would go on forever. <laughs> right, right. That's true. It's I not could, like I English. Could, I could go up against a German person in a spelling in a German spelling bee and do fine. <laughs> yeah, you do pretty well. I think absolutely. That's true. That's very um, true. But apparently, similar thing is similar things happening with Indonesian as well. No, Indonesian mm-hmm. grammatical structures are very different from those in English. But don't th- mm. let that deter you. It lacks. Its lack of rules make learning grammar a lot easier. There are no verb conjugations, no nice. plurals, and no grammatical genders. If you're not a fan of grammat- oh, uh, grammar rules, Indonesian could be a match made in heaven. So it's as actually a little seems a little simpler than English, theoretically okay. speaking. Interesting. Yeah, I mean verb conjugations are difficult, especially with German, um, Spanish. There are a lot of languages where verb conjugations are difficult. Russian, Czech. Um, Genders are also pretty difficult, especially because every language that I know has gender has some type of what we call gender agreement in language learning, which basically just means that the endings of words have to agree with the gender you have. So if you have Mm -hmm. a table and your table is masculine, you need a masculine ending. Or if you have a chair and your chair is feminine, you need a feminine ending if you're describing it. Um, So yeah, so it's it's pretty interesting um, that how grammar can... Make a language easier or more difficult to learn. Um, I will so say Chad, another. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I will no, say no, no, another please. thing that um, makes language learning easier is um, going off of the languages you've learned previously. So if you've learned a language like mm-hmm. Spanish, 
It's yeah, a logical next moves. step to try to learn Italian or Portuguese or French, for example. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, so we've talked about European languages or, or European-based languages being mm-hmm. you know, Spanish, French, uh, German, Dutch. All these languages um, we know... And we've and, and we don't need to you know uh, bear, we we we, need to, we don't need to remind people constantly that those are pretty e- tend to be easier for Americans like us or English speakers. Mm-hmm. Uh, we talked about uh, Asian language, Indonesian, which I didn't mm-hmm. know uh, was similar to English uh, until I looked into this. But now right. we should also talk about an African language that would be surprisingly ing- easy easier for an English speaker to learn. One that I heard was Swahili, because very it's also good, a phonetic language. Parada. Um, and they also have taken, there are some cognates from English. Uh, I believe the word for pencil is similar. The word for machine is similar, things like this. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Any other reasons Swahili is, a, is an easy one or easier for English speakers to learn? Well, it is mostly phonetic, because... Um, it, it's 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 as Babel says the quote unquote least easy of the easiest languages because it's the least comparable to to just overall to what we're used to, mm-hmm. uh, um, and in the way we communicate. Um, but uh, yeah, no, there are similar words, and uh, it's fairly straightforward in terms of grammar. Verb conjugations utilize prefixes in a logical way, making them less difficult for English speakers to learn. If you want to try something different, see Swahili. Uh, see if Swahili is the language for you. However, if you want to pick up a new language as easily as possible, uh, we recommend starting with Spanish, Swedish, or Norwegian. So Swahili is easier. Than a lot of other African languages, it seems like that you know they mm-hmm. it seems like they wanted to get a lot of different con- you know uh, different continents and stuff. Right. But it's by no means the easiest language to learn. And, and I've but heard it's, depending it's on less intimidating than one might think. I think is a right. fair thing to say. Right. And I've heard that in some places in Africa, Swahili is kind of the lingua franca of like if you don't yeah. speak a common language, you use Swahili. Uh, so Jared, I well, want to give you a quick list though. Um, or go ahead. What do you want to say? When I was, I mean, when I was in Tanzania, they speak uh, Swahili there too. But like, when when I when I went to uh, like the the village, like the small villages and stuff, they mm-hmm. spoke uh, like a, a shit ton of different languages, but they all spoke uh, Swahili too. Right. Yeah. Like like so it was just it was just like the the general communication language, and then they had mm-hmm. their you know whatever their you know, more localized language was. Right, sure. Which maybe f- you... was, I wonder if that, sorry, I keep, I wonder if you that get, language was, what, like, like if some of those were like even, I mean, you don't know the answer, were like just all different takes on Swahili or if they were just completely different. Like, that, that's not something I thought to ask in the moment, but but I yeah, wonder I that. No like, are, that's a... are these just all like different dialects that right. you wouldn't understand because they're so localized or is this like just not even on the same page? My guess would be it would be a regional language, and it could be completely unrelated to Swahili. But I'm not sure. I'm not an expert on that. So um, yeah, no, I'm, so not, I'm not trying to yeah. paint you into any uh, corners where you're lying. Right, right. <laughs> so I want to give you a list, though, Jared. Of uh, this is a list from the Foreign Service Institute, which is the U.S. government's diplomatic training agency. So this prepares diplomats to serve at embassies and consulates around the world. Uh, And one of the preparations to becoming a diplomat includes foreign language training. I've met a couple diplomats here in China, Jared, and they all speak... Seems like a nice job. ...pretty good Chinese, um, as they should. Um, And, Jared, just so you know, uh, if you're curious of becoming a diplomat one day, Jared, um, it's eight hours a day of an intensive learning environment to learn the language. Um, I I forget how many weeks it is. I think it's like... If I I like the language. Right. Um, so here is the list. According to the Foreign Service Institute, the languages that fall in the easiest category for English speakers are, and I don't think this is in any particular order. Uh, I think right. this is just a list. So Afrikaans, Dutch, Danish, French, Italian, Norwegian, Portuguese, Romanian, Spanish, and Swedish. Romanian. Yeah, and no German is on here, which I thought was interesting. Um, but Dutch German is, on is not there. on here. Correct. And Afrikaans uh, is on there. Correct, but not German. But, but no mm. German. But what's interesting is that... Maybe they just don't of, need it? May, probably. Uh, I I would assume diplomats in German can probably speak 
Uh, diplomats in Germany can probably speak German, I would imagine. Um, would be but my guess. But diplomats in the Netherlands can probably speak English too. No, 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 no. We're American diplomats in oh, I see. Germany I see and Netherlands. They, they should all speak languages of the countries. Uh, sure. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, if you're a diplomat, you, you, sh- mm-hmm. you should probably commit to learning that language, period. Right. Right. Now, so that's the Foreign Service You're trying to build which, a bond. Right. And now, I don't know how how updated the Foreign Service Institute, you know, how often they change this list, but... Um, this is an interesting one. This is some aspects from a, I don't know which polyglot, but a polyglot's opinions on the easiest languages to learn. Um, so, uh, many polyglots understand that trying to rank languages according to difficulty involves too many variables to be worthwhile. And I'm definitely not saying that there is a number one through number 10 list. Um, and I think it's different for everybody. Um, but what's interesting is... Um, in terms of being objectively easy, Jared, polyglots tend to agree upon the language of Esperanto because Esperanto has many cognates um, that English shares with uh, French. It has consistent spelling rules. There are no conjugations and there's no noun gender. Um, and the reason is because uh, Esperanto was designed to be easy to learn because it's an artificially constructed language. However, even though it was a made-up language, um, it the Esperanto community is huge. I lost Jared at uh, made-up language. The Esperanto community <laughs> well, no, is you huge and active me. all over the world. Um, <laughs> you didn't lose me. We did an episode about Conlang, and it right. was actually one of our most popular episodes. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> but um, I found it very interesting. I just find it sort of eye-rolly that people are claiming that to be the easiest language to learn because it's like yeah but it's also not a re- not a real language in the sense where you can't actively use it you can use it on the internet with okay i'm not gonna say that you can use it uh in very localized places but you can't use it in localized places that you travel to or with like i don't know it's just such an i don't know that's the only reason i right. roll my eyes Ex- yeah i would agree um there, yeah. But it is interesting. I mean, I mean, it's also it's also like well, it's like of course it's the easiest. Like if it's a conlang. I don't know. It's like it's, I don't know. It's uh, it's it's made by maybe someone that's not that good at making. Uh, I, okay, listen. I feel like now I'm go, I'm going. You're getting real personal need, about this, Jared. <laughs> uh, all right, let me let me just. I want to finish. And if a this. polyglot, I feel like a can a polyglot. Now this is the question of the day. Okay. Can a polyglot say a polyglot? speaks four languages uh-huh. one of them is esperanto uh-huh. can that polyglot claim polyglotism say they speak i don't know yeah. english yep chinese yep. korean yep. esperanto yep. that's a polyglot yep 100 percent. still a language made up or not still a language what if it was klingon Kl- klingon sure yeah if that's one of your four oh languages i'd give it to i would them. roll my eyes hard at, in someone's face if they and told then, me they were a polyglot and, and then, then listed when you're klingon. insulting you and it's your still mother impressive. and everybody else in klingon it's still and you impressive. have no idea i'm just gonna sneer at you <laughs> and everyone else who speaks klingon around us who's laughing me, at this person i mean that, wow. that goes, ooh, is this that how be you fun. is that how you roll chad you just make fun of people behind their back granted we did do that's, some of that in and I, I, was gonna, I was gonna say you, you very well know, <laughs> know we did that when we were speaking german together occasionally not always but occasionally no um, no i don't know i mean i guess that goes into jared what what is a language uh and that might be a fun right. question to explore in a later episode i'm mm. um, just saying what is a language um hmm. but yeah i want to to end this segment though jared i want to discuss just some similarities with english for a few different languages um, so we'll start okay. with Afrikaans because we've talked about it. So uh, like mm-hmm. English, Afrikaans is in the West Germanic language family, shares many Germanic derived root words with English, and has a logical non-inflective structure, which means it's just very straightforward mm. to speak. Additionally, Afrikaans is neither verb conjugation nor word gender. So that's a plus. So if you learn German and you're learning Dutch, I believe there's gender in Dutch, and you, and you think, ah, oh, I hate learning these genders. I guess jump ship and learn Afrikaans because there's no genders that you need to. <laughs> Fuck it. No. Right. <laughs> I'm um, learning Af- now f- Afrikaans now. Right. Now, no French. genders. That, I mean, that, that's big. That's definitely that's big changer. for us English speakers. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We're, and English speakers generally are pretty terrible when, uh, I know I am at least, when learning gender. I mean, I mean a for, lot of it you just my, have to memorize. My entire time in Germany studying abroad in Austria, 
You know, I mm-hmm. knew a good number of words just off because I either oftenly used words. Mm-hmm. But anytime you, I went slightly off the map with my noun usage, maybe mm-hmm. I know the noun in German, but I'll just, right. you know, you kind of just guess. Like, hey, it ends with yep. an E. I'll just assume it's D. <laughs> right, right, right. I don't know. And there, and there aren't any, at least in German, there aren't any strict rules. Um, right. I have a document floating around somewhere that there are. And everyone some, knows like, what tips, you're saying. They're not going to be yeah. confused. Well, that's the thing: is gender is more so or less weird, not very meaning because based. Everyone gets what you're saying, even if you get it right. completely wrong every time. Right. But it's just an aspect of the language. So let me talk about a few yeah. more, Jared. So French. Approximately one third of modern English language has been influenced by French, mm. which makes it a familiar territory for a native English learner. Uh, English has more in common lexically or word wise with French than any other Romance language, meaning an understanding of French vocabulary will come easy. I mean, there are a lot of French words that I see that I can recognize for sure. Sure. Um, and there's, so a, I think there's probably a lot more overlap between, like, like mm-hmm. usage in, in sort of a pop. Like like in in stores or popular culture of French than maybe even Spanish because I think French seems a little more exotic to us than Spanish right. does. Right now for learners of Spanish, most words in Spanish are written as pronounced, so pronunciation is very straightforward. Uh, uh, and then Spanish uh, generally has fewer language irregularities than other Romance languages, so there's less but irregularity Spanish? in Spanish than French. Spanish does have some tone to it, though. Like you, d- granted, it is clear in the writing, but right. um, there, there is you do have. There's definitely tone that you do have to take into account, and that right. that at least in in my small amount of Spanish learning that I've done, that that's that's been something that that I've that I've not struggled with, but just had to remind be reminded of. Right, right, yeah. Um, so yeah, so those are some aspects of language. I got one little question to ask you, Jared, and then we can uh, move on to the song of the pod. Um, how long do you think, according to the Foreign Institute, mm. a lot of these easier languages take to learn? If you do eight hours a day, I believe it's whoop, I believe it's eight hours a day, five days a week. How long? Three months. Okay, you're not too far off. In order Six to months. get to a professional level, they say around five months. Okay. Mm-hmm. See, in my head, I thought I could probably do it in six months. Mm-hmm. But then I thought they, I, I feel like they have, and I thought, well, okay, they probably have their course down better right. than that. You know? Well, so here you go, Jared. So the Foreign Service Institute estimates that languages in this group, which is like the easier group, which were those languages I listed earlier, can take 23 to 24 weeks to reach professional working proficiency. What this means is. Uh, professional working pr- proficiency, say that five times fast. Um, <laughs> I can't say it uh, once. <laughs> is the following. Yeah, I barely can as well. Uh, understand almost everything people say when they speak at a normal speed, communicate comfortably in most situations, mm. and use a broad vocabulary and rarely stop to search for words. So there you go. Right. You know, an, an, important, an important aspect of learning a language to me, and this is something that I always noticed, especially in my German classes, that would kind of separate the uh, weak from the chaff, mm-hmm. uh, would be that, that as I'm doing right now, actually, that stuttering, that looking for words. Mm-hmm. I think even more than anything, that that was, was always a sign to me, you know, where it's like, oh, this, like, this person... It's that freezing and looking for words. You, I don't know, you can just see it, that, uh, um, uh... Right. Even right. even if the words they find are the right ones, mm-hmm. it's it's the thinking about what you're everything you're gonna say. Except we do that in English sometimes too. So I think yeah, you're I mean, being as little... I was saying that, I got really self conscious because I was doing right. it too. But yeah. <laughs> Anyways, you know how you can avoid getting self conscious, Jared. Listen to some super yes. funky music. What is yes. our song of the pod for today? I was gonna hum it. Uh, it's Steve Monite, only you. And Steve Monite is from Nigeria. And do you know what this song made me think of? What? Daft Punk. I got strong Daft Punk vibes from the from the uh, from the like the beat or the melody. Okay. What do you call it? Like the the uh, computer generated beat or whatever. Yeah, yeah. The beat. I, I, and like, like, no, no. I you mean, s- the, do you mean the synthesizer? Yeah, like the but the whole thing. Part? The whole okay. thing. 
I guess just all the electronic parts of it then. The synth, it, it, the, 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 the yeah, beats. the electronic production of it had gave me some sort of Daft Punk vibes. And I assume now this song came out in the eighties, and for some mm-hmm. reason, I, first of all, this song is great. It's very funky. Um, mm-hmm. It's like it's uh, just a uh, you know classic eighties funk. I would say. Yep. It's interesting for me to think about other countries, other f- foreign countries jamming out to music like this because this at least to me seems like very specifically american and i thought is this just was this just what they were listening to on their own or 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 were they still heavily influenced by american media and music is that why this music sounded so similar or is this just Mm -hmm. just the time is this bigger than countries is this just the time like computers were just just as new to the people in nigeria as they were to the people in uh in the u.s that were that were making you know that's that heavily synthy sort of computer music with that funky sound and i wonder if if they still had if they had that influence or or if that's just or if if it's just bigger than than that I, i don't know I don't. I don't have an answer for you. Um, only speculation. But it is interesting here, to me. I, I do like the idea of like people in Nigeria jamming out to the song, which, by the way, is in English. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it like in the eighties in some in some club in Nigeria. That seems like a, right. a cool scene I, to to witness. I do like the sound of his Nigerian accent, though. Yes, I think yeah. it sounds super cool. Yeah, he doesn't with, sound American. Over top of everything. No, definitely not. But, but uh, yeah, it's a super funky song. The mm-hmm. bass is slapping. Yeah, that bass line, man. I could listen to yep. that bass line for hours. <laughs> um, yeah, that bass line is something else. It's it's mm-hmm. super awesome. Um, what's the song title in Argus again, Jared? Steve Monite, only you. So check that out on only our YouTube you. channel, uh, Untranslatable Podcast, our song of the pod playlist. Especially if you want, if you got the funk or you mm-hmm. need the funk, you will find it right there. That is for sure. Uh, mm-hmm. Well, Jared, you know, we try to promote language learning here. And uh, I got to say, uh, I'm going to be honest with you and all of our listeners out there. I've been super lazy all vacation. The only work I've done has Quote been unquote. looking up materials for teaching for the upcoming semester. Other than that, I have been slacking on mm. my Chinese learning. But That's okay. I do have a Chinese word of the pod today. And it is, uh, one second here, it is uh, jian dan, which means easy. Mm, that's good. Mine is a Spanish word of the pod, and it's incapaz. Which means what? Incapable. Oh. Uh, now, this is sort of the antithesis of, of our episode, but I like the word incapaz. Incapaz. Mm-hmm. And um, you're not incapable of learning any language. Uh, and any language can that. be an easy language to learn if you really want to learn it, to be honest with you. Because... Uh, really more than anything it's it's deep immersion and willingness mm-hmm. to take in as much information as possible like i was reading something Absolutely. also and they say like 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 if if you really want to i was looking up like learning languages fast and they're like you have to be ready to like walk around with dictionaries do kind of like what students on your campus do and just like dig your nose into it which is right. easy to do if you really want to learn oh yeah and, and if you also don't, I guess one thing we didn't mention as well is if you don't have a barrier. What I mean by this is like when I was learning German, I, I don't know. I think it was just because to me, it was so important to learn the language. I knew I was going to make mistakes and I didn't care about sounding stupid. Mm. Oh, I did. For me, it was I like if did. I can if I can express <laughs> myself, eventually I will express myself in a coherent mm. and intelligible and hopefully not stupid sounding manner. Uh, and I think eventually it came it came to that. Uh, maybe not until Austria or maybe even until graduate school, but it came <laughs> to that eventually. Um, so I think a lot of people, especially I see this in my Chinese students all the time, is they, one, they haven't had enough perfect. practice speaking, but they um, are really afraid of making mistakes. And, and mm-hmm. here in China, losing face is a big thing. You don't want to make mistakes. Uh, you don't yeah. want to lose that social standing, but it's a part of the process. And I think if you embrace that part of the process, it will make language learning a lot easier as well. Um, yeah, it's impossible to go through the language learning process process without making mistakes. That just doesn't really make any sense. It, yeah, it doesn't. And it won't work. Um, so yeah, so just to recap our episode, even though I think Jared already did it, I'll just quickly oh. recap um, what makes a language learning easy. Definitely motivation. 
the relation to your own native language or also foreign languages you've learned. So if you've learned Spanish, uh, you probably don't even need to hear me say this, but learning another Romance language like Italian or French or Portuguese will most likely be Many easier freguista. for you than learning like Russian or Swahili or something. Um, so yeah. Uh, also, obviously, motivation and the target language uh, make uh, play a key role. But as Jared said as well, being very immersed in the language and having access to the language as well. If your only access to a language is a couple language books, um, I'm not trying to discourage you from learning that language. I think it's great that you want to learn a foreign Quit. language. But <laughs> Jared not said it, not though. me. But um, <laughs> no, try no, to no, no, find please. other means of making the language accessible. So luckily, nowadays with the internet, there are so many different ways where you can get access to languages mm -hmm. um, as long as you have access uh, in the country that you live. Um, so, so check that out. So um, keep those things in mind. Let us know what languages are easy for you to learn at untranslatablepodcast at gmail.com. Slide into our DMs on Twitter with any language learning tips you may have on Translatable One. And check out our Instagram page for all sorts of pictures of our shenanigans. Um, you can see what I've been up to in China and uh, see what uh, trouble Jared's been getting in in uh, Michigan. And lastly, yes. please, five-star reviews on iTunes and Stitcher. Let us know how we can make this podcast better for you. So as we say here at the Untranslatable Podcast, which is gracias. Sure, sure.